I need to know everything Who and the what and the where I need everything Trust me, I hear what you're saying But act like it's new what you're telling me I'm curious, George, I hop in the Porsche with five and a horse, I'm ready for war I'm coming for throws to turn to a ghost I need to know everything Now you be surprised at the info you get Is by letting them talk, so I'm letting them talk Gotta keep quiet, maneuver in science Then let them in talk up their body Another one. Hello and welcome to JK Plus One I am not your host, PTF Even though I think I'm gonna see him tomorrow um, Going to the city to record uh, my video podcast with Angel Cordero, and I think PTF's going to come by and chaperone, or at least bring some beverages, or take me to lunch afterwards in some New York town, and, or New York place in New York, and you know, we'll see what happens, but I am your host, Jonathan Kinchin, and uh, I'm really excited about the guest uh, we have on today, um, I, just the enthusiasm uh, just seeps from his pores. Um, he, he, he's owned some of the, my favorite horses uh, of all time. And, and, and it, it has to be uncle Mo is one of those. And, and, uh, and he's, he's also, I enjoy his, uh, his beverages as well. Body armor, very delicious, uh, delicious beverage. And, uh, Mike Rapoli, Rapoli stables. He's, he's got the favorite this weekend Forte in the Florida Derby. He's got, uh, the, as of right now, the favorite in the Kentucky Derby. And, and obviously that, that could, uh, will be affected by the results of Saturday's race. We talk a little bit about Forte. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, his business. We talk a lot about uh, Uncle Mo. Um, we talk a lot about yeah, the, the holes he sees in this industry, um, some of his goals. It, it's, it was a really fun conversation. You get to learn a lot about Mike, and uh, I'm glad that you, uh, you're all on uh, along for the ride. Uh, I want to thank our friends at Guitar Racing uh, for the support. Uh, thank you for uh, helping get these shows out to people so they can learn more about uh, the personalities that are, are in our, our game that we all love. So thank you to Qatar Racing. Uh, make sure you subscribe, download, retweet. And I'm telling you, Mike wanted to know what the record was for downloads for one of these episodes. And I let him know that currently the record is uh, Duke Matisse uh, that we did kind of in that season one that has the most downloads um, of any show that we've ever done on the network period but also uh, especially the JK plus one situation so Mike wants his to be um, be number one so you know hopefully you, you can help him uh, achieve that goal uh, I'll, I'll, I'll quit rambling and we'll get to uh, my friend your friend racing's friend the man behind the blue and the orange Mike Rapoli. All right. This is just a, we're just free flowing conversation. Whatever it goes, it goes. That's awesome. Jonathan, Jonathan, who's that a picture of? That doesn't look like you. Yeah. That's a, that's a, our, our producer that set up this account for us. Well, it looks like he, he thinks he's you, by the way. <laughs> what do most people call you? JK or Jonathan or both? Both. Just a combination of both. Whatever comes out. I like Jonathan, but I could, oh, I could use JK. So okay. okay. All right. Um, I'll just count us in and we'll just hit it running. All right. So you lead. Yep. If I want to ask questions because I want to have fun, I can. A thousand percent. It's better that way. But Jonathan, I want to let you know, honestly, like how many people have you had on this? Uh, this is 37, 36, 37, 38. I've had it. All right. And what do you, where do you put it on? You put it on YouTube? You put it on your own thing? What do you, what do you Yeah, do? it'll be, it'll be on all the podcast stuff, like all the podcast sources. It'll be on uh, YouTube, it'll be everywhere, everywhere you what can you, get podcasts. What's an average? I don't know. A thousand people, five thousand people, one thousand, uh, hundred. The average and the entire shelf life is about forty five hundred. Listen to it. Forty five hundred. Um, explain what that means. Forty five hundred. What does that mean? Like downloads. Forty five hundred people will download and listen to this hour and a half hour conversation, whatever it is. So forty five hundred is the average. What's the record? Uh, it's, uh, my friend Duke Matisse, who's a professional, uh, gambler, professional horse player. His is like 60, he's got like 60 something hundred. All right. Tell, tell you guy Duke that it's, you're going to have the second one, the second most. Okay. Okay. Cool. I got it. So <laughs> what do you go? this is, this is micro poly unfiltered about anything it. from horse racing to life to, uh, people in the game to whatever you want. Um, and there's no, uh, It'll be fun. It will be fun. But just, I don't want you like, oh, Mike, you know, 
let me tell you, um, I have zero sensitivity to anything you ask, which will make it a very easy, uh, easy for you just to say, you know what, whatever the fuck I want to ask this guy, he's going to answer it. I love okay? it. It's going to be fun. Okay. So, um, I'll be great. If you're good, it's going to be very good. How's that sound? I love it. Let's go. All right. So step up. Let's go. All right. Three, two, one. Mike, I, I got to tell you, uh, I've seen you on TV a little bit lately. You look like you're losing some weight. Are you, are you trying to get fit for this this derby suit, or what, what are we doing here? Yeah, I think I call it the stress diet. It's been unbelievable since uh, I think we're up to about 270 horses now, and uh, we bought five two-year-olds last year. But, you know, first of all, I sold my company at the end of 2021, and it was that was 10 years of, um, you know, crazy intensity and uh, – you know, 19 to 20 hour days for only, only about 10 years. So I, I think last year was a little bit of a transformation year um, into running my family office and getting more involved and even horse racing and some of my other, other ventures like private equity and, and real estate. And, uh, you know, I moved to Florida about four years ago. The winters are pretty good here. Um, and I just think it's really just, uh, you know, getting outside more, eating healthier, sleeping better, um, so that's real important. And, uh, I appreciate you noticing that I, I probably did lose about 20 pounds and, um, you know, uh, now I'll lose a few more because, uh, you know, every day I wake up and, you know, my first phone call is Todd Fletcher to see how, uh, horses like Forte and Dreamlike and all me, my other horses are doing. And it's, uh, you know, that, that's the one side, Jonathan, that people don't understand as an owner. Like they think they just see at the races and you're having a great time and, you know, you bring your friends and family, but, you know, each work, like Forte works Saturday. I think I text Todd at 4.44 in the morning. Uh, he went out at 7. Um, Jose was on him. Um, talk to Todd. Text Jose. You know, make sure he came out good and then got the post positions later that day. So uh, a lot more goes into this behind the scenes of being an owner of, of such a big stable. Do you, I mean, have, have you, is this these next – you know, five weeks, or you just, do you feel just super nervous or are you, are you able to enjoy it or is just the nerves uh, a lot? You, you know, it's, it's actually all the above. And, and I think that's the, the beauty of what, what this is about. It's, there's a lot of anxiousness. There's a lot of um, nervousness. There's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of enthusiasm. You know, thank God I have a, about 75 naive, gullible friends and family member that are more worried about where we're going to dinner on Friday night, um, where we're going to celebrate on Saturday night. Um, I mean, it's just, uh, my wife leads that. She's just, an, she's amazing. Maria, um, you know, from everything in life, when, when I'm, I'm worried from one to a hundred, a hundred, she's worried less than 10. And, uh, you know, having my daughter Joya there, you know, it's, it's something new for me, you know, being a little older and having a seven and a half year old who, you know, she just has a great time no matter what. So um, I've, I've said recently, losing a big race with her on your side, um, you know, kind of kind of makes it easier. And, you know, you know, my friends laugh at me when I say, all right, let's just go for ice cream. Um, that doesn't sound like the intense, crazy, passionate micro poly they know. But, you know, you know, you want to win. But, you know, life is good, man. God is great. And, you know, I'm blessed to be in a situation like this. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's got to be a pretty big transformation. Like you said, you sold the company 10 years ago. So it's like, or, or, or I'm sorry, you worked on the company for, for 10 years. You sold it in 21. Now you're a, a, you, you've got a, a seven-year-old daughter. You're, you've got a lot more horses in training, and you don't have the stresses of business. Uh, it's a different micro poly, I'm assuming. Yeah, I, I mean, Jonathan, honestly, the best way to describe it is, you know, I had two 10-year runs in business. The first one was vitamin water and small water. And I was 28, 29 when I started that with Elvin. I know back then, um, probably that was built on naiveness. I think if I knew now, uh, I knew then what I know now, I, I probably would have never even started something like that. And, uh, you know, those first 10 years were about stress. You know, I mean, you know, I, you know, my, everybody, I think people know my dad was a waiter. My mom was a seamstress and, uh, you know, I, uh, I got a tremendous amount of love, but you know, I shared a room with my brother until I was 28 years old, uh, you know, and I didn't move out with my parents because uh, the rent was cheap. And uh, and my grandmother did a lot of my errands. So I was pretty blessed. But those 10 years were about stress. It was about, 
you know, making it for not only me, but 600 employees and friends and family that were investors. And then I took like, you know, I started to invest in businesses. And then the second time with body armor, it was more about pressure. You know, the stress is you had to make it. And then the pressure was not only wanting to do it again, but also wanting it for others more than you wanted it for yourself. Um, you know, and, and, and now it's, it's, it's really just about, you know, trying to, you know, I always say I got three goals now in life and in racing. I want to win. Um, I want to have fun and I want to share success. Um, but it's still, um, it's still pressure, but you know, I, listen, I want to win for my team. I want to win for Todd Pletcher. I want to win for, you know, Irad Ortiz, uh, you know, guys that have been with me, like, you know, Jim Martin and, um, uh, Ed Rosen and my friends and family that support me and the new people I've brought on. I mean, you know, I want to win for them more than I want to win for, 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 for myself. I mean, this is what Todd has been thinking about since he was, uh, you know, a kid in Texas. This is what Irad and, you know, has been thinking about since he was uh, a kid in Puerto Rico. I mean, you know, I want to, I want to help them uh, reach their biggest dreams and and max their potential. Mike, if, if uncle Mo was your, your kind of, your coming out party for your horse racing life, I'm guessing that's, that's true. Him and stay thirsty, but you know, I think uncle Mo more, even more so just because of how, brilliant he was and and and, and the, the kind of his journey with getting ill and coming back and we'll talk about him for sure i've never had this conversation with you when it comes to business what, what who was your in smart water and vitamin water and maybe even body armor whichever one you want to go with what was your uncle mo moment in those two businesses that you had like that oh this is the this is the big moment for these 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 brands yeah i mean jonathan it's, it's a great question i mean what people don't see sometimes is you know Anytime you build a business or anytime you have incredible success in your life, um, there's, there's four or five or six years that I call the survival years. Um, those are the scene, those are the years that nobody knows about you. Those are the years that, you know, you know, it's a probably a 1% chance of making it at anything you do. And, you know, you know, I owned my first horse in 2005. Um, it was either different kind or the rodeo man. My trainer was Kate DeMassey. Then I had Mike Maselli and Bruce Levine. You know, before I even thought about using Todd Pletcher in 2009 or 2008, you know, I was in this game four or five years. I mean, you know, Todd was known to me as the, the guy who walked by my seats to go to the winner's circle while, while my horses were coming in fifth, sixth, and seventh, and eighth. And I was in this game you know, with horses like Driven by Success and Nona Mia um, that people didn't know about just because I didn't want to start off day one and say, hey, I'm going to go to this guy, Todd Pletcher, and I'm going to use Johnny Velasquez. Um, no, it was about using, you know, jockeys um, a, a little bit different in Aqueduct Winter, you know, in a, in a, in a track at Aqueduct type jockeys. And the business is the same way. You know, you know, at, at, at Vitamin Water from 1998 to 2003, um, it took five years to get to $10 million. Body Armor was the same way. You know, the first year we did a million, lost $5 million. I don't think that's pretty good. Then we did $4 million minus 12. And then we did $6 million minus 12. And uh, $10 million minus 10. And $25 million minus uh, 10. So finally, the revenue in, in, after five years was bigger than the loss. This is not something they would teach in Harvard Business School. So um, those are survival years and horse racing, the same thing. So, you know, I, people think, uh, you know, you know, I love, I mean, listen, there are people who like me and probably people who don't like me. I mean, you know, I, I appreciate the people who like me and I get motivated by the people who don't like me. I mean, you know, those five or six years when you're out working 18 hour days, seven days a week and, 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 and people think you just came on the scene six years later on anything you do they didn't see the work that was put in the first six years when you were just trying to survive. So I think it's more about, you know, when you talk about uncle Mo, I mean, it, it's, it's about driven by success. You know, what was the turning point? You know, most people would tell you a turning point in horse racing was the year that I won this race. or the year I won that now, the year that turned it around for me in racing was Saratoga 2009. Um, I had 37 starters. 
And this was, you know, and I didn't, I had horses with, you know, a bunch of trainers, not named Todd, Todd Pletcher. And I think I might be the only person that's ever gone 0 for 37 as an owner in 2009. And not too many people know that. And first of all, 99.9% .9 of people 0 for, 0 for 37 get out of the game. Um, sometimes I said, maybe I should have done that, but my competitive nature wouldn't let me. So um, I had eight seconds, eight thirds. I had a horse named Digger run a hundred fire and lose. I always tell people that's like bowling 299 and losing to a guy that bowls 300. I driven by success, lose at one to five. I'd go, go shoot, lose, lose the fabulous strike in the Vosburg. I mean, I, I couldn't win. Um, I rented a house that year at Saratoga. When I pass it now, 11 years later, I still... I still get chills. I call it that haunted house. Scares the hell out of me. It's in Teller Street. And, uh, you know, listen, usually you go over 37. You know, I obsessed for a year. I made some big moves. Um, I called Todd Pletcher. I went to dinner with him at Rothman Steakhouse. I have to speaking to him in 07 and 08 and 09, not being ready. And um, you know, Todd will tell you. I went to dinner with him and I said, listen, I'm ready to, you know, I'm either going to get out of this game or I'm going to get much bigger. And, um, you know, we sat there and Todd didn't know me and I probably wasn't any different than I was here. I told him I was driven. I told him I was going to have great horses. I told him I'd have some of the best horses in a stable. I told him that, you know, if I want to do this, I can do this in a big way. Um, I think he was just sipping gray gooses while I was talking. Um, but, but a lot of what I said, you know, 15 years later has come at, come to, it come to fruition and, you know, I thought about it. I, I planned it. I dreamt it and I worked for it. And, uh, you know, I mean, nowadays when I speak to kids or, you know, being 53 versus being 23, you know, listen, the same personality at 53 is the, is the same one I had at 23, same attitude, same work ethic. And, uh, I wish more people would do that. And, um, you know, success is measured differently by everybody, but, you know, the harder you work, the luckier you get. The harder you work, the more successful you get. So I think the moment for me was going 0 for 37. And, 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 and you know, Jonathan, a lot of people don't know this. When I went 0 for 37, most people would just want to win one fucking race the following year. Um, I wanted to win the racing title. I said, I got to wipe away this 0 for 37. So if you check the records, I won the racing title in 2000. Um, 2010 with 15 wins. I went from 0, 0 for 37 to leading owner at Saratoga. By the way, I, I then came back and said, you know what? I got to do it again. And I did it in 2011. And then I said, one more time, I got to do it again. And my wife was so upset that I spent three summers not only watching every single one of my horses and talking to Todd and working with the condition book, but I was so obsessed. I was watching every start that Ramsey had. Claridge, Michael Dubb, because I knew I had a win and they had a lose. And I spent six weeks just obsessing about that. And uh, I won all three years. I think Michael Dubb came in second all three years. I had to apologize almost to him. And, you know, he's now won it a bunch of times, which is good. And, and I told my wife, Maria, I said, that's it. I'm done. I never want to win this. Race. I never want to try this hard to win the title. I've been in second like a three or four times, but that was it, man. And you know, a lot of times, Jonathan, it's through adversity that you get your big break. Well, people look at it as like, oh, shit, I'm out. Oh, shit. That's the end of it. I kind of look at it as, OK, we're just getting started now. Now, so you've always, you know, you, you talk about the success. You've, you've won the title at Saratoga, but it really feels like for me and, and obviously being friendly with you and knowing you and seeing you and knowing people on your team. I, I'm, I'm more aware, I think, than maybe others are that it really feels like you're ramping up. Like you're buying more horses. You have a, you're, you're, you're kind of putting together an, an all-star team as it were. What, what are the goals now for Rapoli stable? Like, what is it exactly I, as a man who's had the success you've had in business? I know there's a plan. What is the plan? Yeah. I mean, listen, I, you know, clearly want all dirt racing in the United States to go through Rapoli stable. Um, I, I want to be better. I want to build a dynasty. Um, you know, when you have guys like um, uh, Jim Martin and Ed Rosen that have been with you for 12, 13 years, uh, when you add someone like Daniel Bricker for all these years, uh, uh, you know, for the last couple of years, and then, you know, Jake West, who's been with me for at least, 
six, seven, eight years. And then you win eight grade ones last year and you win the Belmont Stakes and you win the Alabama and you win a Breeders' Cup and you have two champions. And then you still want to bring out Alex Solis and Jason Litt and Madison. And you want to add more pieces to the puzzle. And you know that Todd can't take every single horse. So now you start to send horses to Brittany Russell and you start to send horses to Mike McCarthy and you start to send horses to George Weaver is going to have a bunch of horses this year. Um, you know, I mean, Todd is, you know, Todd is, you know, Todd is family. Todd is not even a trainer. If Todd was only my trainer, he would be nicer to me. He would treat me better and not, you know, not be so tough on me. Uh, but, uh, you know, he's family. So, I mean, you know, I definitely want to, you know, Todd's going to have every horse he wants, but there's so many good ones and certain that might fit other trainers and, you know, some that might be sprinters and um, that I might want to go somewhere else. Um, but no, I mean, Jonathan, this is not, I mean, I want to, uh, I want to win, man. I want to win. I want to have fun. Um, it's, it's a place I really enjoy, um, being at Lexington for the sale. I was at OBS last week for two days and, you know, I enjoy the sale, but then I enjoy, you know, you know, you know, the dinner that we had in, uh, in Saratoga with your, uh, future, uh, uh, in-laws and, and your, your wonderful fiance and her brothers. I mean, you know, to me, that's a really special night. And last week we're at Mark's and we've had some parties at prime and, um, it's special, man. I mean, you know, it's part of the enjoyment. It's part of the sharing the success and, you know, you know, you know, listen, man, life is short, man. And we're, we're only here a short time. We might as well make the most of it. You mentioned Jim Martin. Uh, I, I would like for you to tell a story uh, about how there wouldn't have been an Uncle Mo if it wasn't for Jim Martin uh, making some decisions on his own. You know, Jim has been a, a guy who I met years ago, and Jim's about 20 years older than me, and I actually met him just – I was a Bronco fan. He was a Kansas Chief, uh, Kansas City Chief fan, and um, I respect Jim a lot. He was a New York City cop like my brother and many other people I know, and uh, – you know, in the early days, I mean, uh, what did I know about horse racing? What did Jim know about horse racing? Not much. But, you know, when it came to Uncle Mo, you know, the, you know, the great um, legendary, unfortunately, passed away, Jimmy Krupe. Um, and Jim really got along at Ocala. Jim moved him and his wife, Jorita, to Ocala. And we started to buy horses. And, you know, we bought an Indian Charlie in 2008 for $350,000 that I, I think I named Our Pirate's Booty. And, I think it was a horse that Jimmy Krupe told me at the time I needed to have. Um, so I, I think he was successful when I made him 25. So um, I get a call from Jim, um, and he says that Jim Krupe has a, has a horse you have to have. And the hip was like 1173. Um, if I look it up, it's probably very close, by the way. And 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 I was I was um, out of my office, and I got I got there two hours later and ran to open up the book to see what 1173 was. And the first thing I saw was Indian Charlie. And I'm like, what? I am not buying an Indian Charlie. And I still have scars from our pirate's booty. So out of respect for Krupe, um, you know, I said, listen, I'll, uh, he loves the horse. It's going to go for four or $500,000. I'll be polite. I'll bid up to 200000 and I'll just gracefully exit. And um, I remember that, you know, at the time they called me and the horse is in the ring and there was nobody rooting for this horse to go. I was going to spend 200. Please just go to 210. I don't care if he sells for 210 or 1 million. I just don't want to own him, but I'm going to be very polite here. It starts to slow down about 150 and 160, 170. Now I'm actually getting nervous. Like I might own this horse and I don't want to. Um, so I bid 200 and it stalls for a while. And uh, I think I'm, I, I think I'm going to get him for 200. And then somebody bids 210. I, my first thought was, whew, thank God. But Jim in the moment says, Mike, hit him one more time. Hit him one more time. He said like 10 times in a row. When he said hit him one more time, I actually thought he meant hit him or hit Krupe one more time for letting me spend this bullshit money. And uh, I said hit him again. And we got him at 220. And I remember hanging up the phone thinking I just wasted 220. And a year later... Um, almost exactly to the year 
first week of September to last week in August, Uncle Mo breaks his maiden by 14 and three quarters length, uh, runs a 102 buyer. And, you know, that was the hit him one more time. And, uh, you know, you never know, right? So we got you, pretty blessed with that one. Were you there when he when he won by 14? I was I was there. It was Travers Day. And the I don't nobody knows who won the Travers that day, but everybody knows that they were there for the Uncle Mo debut. I mean, it was I it was, I Bill Parcells came in the winner's circle with me. I mean, Todd, this is one of my obviously my I mean, like Todd had a couple two-year-olds. We broke a maiden with the year before. This was his second crop for me. Uh, we had over communicate uh, over communication and man in the glass. And I didn't really know. I would ask Todd questions, but he was still, uh, I'll say this with respect, very vanilla back then. Uh, he had one or two word answers. <laughs> and I knew he liked them, but I didn't have a barometer on, on what. But when I got there, and it was a 14 horse field and the, and the oh, 12 horse field and the horse was four to five or three to five. I, I thought that was very weird. And he was breaking from the three poles. And um, yeah, I, I didn't know what happened. Honestly, I just, I was still in awe. Next day, I never had a horse like this. I think I got offered three million, four million the next day by two different people. And uh, that was it. I never won a stake race. I never won a graded stake race. I was 0 for 35 in graded stake races. So this was just a maiden and he was off to the champagne. And a lot of people don't know the first graded stake I ever won after being 0 for 35 was the champagne with Uncle Mo. And 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 the second graded stake I won was the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. I mean, so I mean it came, it came fast. And then honestly, I I don't think the stables look back in the last 14 years. Do, Mike, do you do you bet when on your horses or do you you already feel invested enough? Yeah, no, I no, I I, I bet I spent 20 million dollars on yearlings. So that's my bet. But you know what? I'm I'm a kid from Queens. I used to go to Aqueduct and bet two dollars to win, place, and show, you know, on a five to one and have an old man put the bet in. So, you know, my bets are funny. I even though if I paid eight hundred, I bet five hundred to win, five hundred to place, depends. I'll if I really like it, I'll bet a thousand win, thousand place. But I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm still I'm still a I'm still a kid for Queens. I, I mean, I that, that's what I bet. It's so hard now, Jonathan. I know you're such a great handicapper for me to handicap because I go down and I see, oh, oh, it's Todd Pletcher. I can't root against Todd. Oh, man, it's owned by this other owner. I really like that owner. I can't root against him. Oh, that guy claimed the three or four of my horses. I like this horse, but you know what? He just claimed three horses in a row for me. I hope he loses. So I, I can't handicap. It, it's so hard for me to handicap now because – I really, oh, Irad's on this one. Jose's on this one. Johnny's on that one. You know, it's, it's, I root for people. So it's just hard for me to handicap. Um, and, uh, and, and basically it's just, I'm betting one place for my horses just to keep busy. Tell me about the journey with Uncle Mo when, when, when he got ill and, and just, you know, kind of that roller coaster. What, what was, what was that like for you? You know, it was, when you look at it now, there, there was so much beauty in that adversity. Um, you know, you come in, this is your dream. I think I was 40 at the time, 41. Um, you know, I was getting to know Todd, Tracy, and the family. My family was used to going to races on Wednesday afternoon at 3.30 for a never win two for 25000 And... You know, we win the champagne. We go to the Breeders' Cup. Uh, it's the year that Zinata and Blame and Golda Cover and Uncle Mo, and and then we were on this derby ride with not only Uncle Mo but Stay Thirsty. And you know, Timely Rider grows great. Um, Stay Thirsty wins the Gotham, and looks like we're pretty, you know, doing pretty good here. And um, and then Uncle Mo you know, at one to nine, you know, loses the Wood Memorial, you know, and Todd said he was a little funny, like he was a little off, a little bit low energy, but maybe he was just maturing as a three-year-old. And uh, I'll never remember, I'll never forget the Dirk and Call when he lost the Wood, the biggest upset since Secretariat. And, um, you know, I, I, Todd said, let's figure it out. Let's just regroup. And, 
And then I just remembered that we got, you know, just this enzyme, liver enzymes were off a little bit. And listen, it was tremendous adversity, but you know what? When I realized that, it, I realized that I wasn't in the game to win the Kentucky Derby. Um, Uncle Mo bought so much fun, um, so much love, so much excitement. Um, he was such a blessing and still is, by the way. And that it was more about the family and friends aspect and about rooting together. And the champagne felt like Thanksgiving and the Breeders' Cup felt like Christmas and the Derby run felt like, you know, an extra holiday, and, you know, having my grandmother around back then and, and my parents and, uh, and my wife, Maria, and my brother, and my sister, and all my friends, it just made it really, really special. And then when he wasn't doing well, you know, just the friendship with Todd uh, being built. Anybody give me friends, you know, when you, when you win a race and you walk to the winner's circle. But when, 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 you know, Todd cared more about Uncle Mo and me than he did himself. And I cared more about Uncle Mo and Todd than I did myself. And I think that there was a lot of our friendship was really built as that, you know, foundation uh, of, of adversity of going through. We, we had the same thing. We didn't want to win the Derby anymore. We were really concerned. You know, this horse was losing 50 pounds, 100 pounds, 150. I mean, I paid hundreds of thousands to get him the best doctors and it wasn't about whether he was ever going to race again. They couldn't find what was wrong with him. And he kept losing weight. And I remember Todd always telling me, if you just keep losing weight, it can't be good. So we really just sent them out and we turned them out. And uh, I want to thank Winstar and Elliot Walden and Kenny Shroud. I mean, we just sent them out to Winstar. And, you know, we just checked his liver, liver enzymes and they started to go in the right direction. No medication, no nothing. Um, he started to gain weight again and, um, you know, Todd and I talked about, Hey, maybe we can try to bring him back. And, um, Todd's best training job ever probably was getting uncle Mo ready to go seven furlongs in the King's Bishop. It wasn't called, it's not called the King's Bishop anymore. Alan Jerkins. And, um, and to get a horse that hasn't raced since March to go seven furlongs at Saratoga. And he got to the lead. He lost his shoe at the top of the stretch. And then Caleb's posse caught him at the wire. And uh, I got news here. It was so sad. It was so depressing. And I felt bad for Todd and all the time and energy and work. And I felt so bad for Uncle Mo because he needed this and he deserved it. Um... And the irony was right after I got done sobbing, I had 20 minutes to post to the Travers, which stay thirsty. And you want to talk about the highs and the low of this game. 22 minutes later, I'm jumping up and down and stay thirsty wins the Travers. And, and what a dream come true. And uh, I, re I remember he, he got to the lead and a horse by the name of Rattlesnake Bridge was coming. And I was saying to myself, if, if I lose both these races today by a nose, I might just get out of racing. And, uh, and we won the race. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was an it was a incredible consolation prize. But really wanting to win that race for Mo um, was really, really special. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, Uncle Mo came back and gave us one more you know, performance for the ages in the Kelso with 117 buyer, um, you know, wasn't, went backwards again in the, um, the classic, unfortunately, but, you know, he went off to stud and, you know, the rest is history. I mean, just watching Kings Bond the other day um, go three for three and all the babies he has right now. And, you know, from Nyquist, uh, you know, I had outwork to, to so many great horses and what Todd and I have been talking about lately you know, he's now becoming a uh, sire of broodmares. And that's exciting because you see a lot of good horses and you see not only Uncle Mo as the sire of these horses, now you're seeing, you know, Curlin on top of an Uncle Mo and Intermissive on the top of an Uncle Mo mare. And 
this is a horse of a generation that's going to change the bloodlines of racing for the next, you know, 200 years. And uh, that makes me really, really proud. Uh, Mike, you, you know, you, you've, through this conversation, it's been very apparent, you know, how much the relationships in racing matter to you. As disappointing as it was on, uh, in Derby in 2011 when you had to, to scratch Uncle Mo, it, it, there is a little bit of uh, an underlying thing that Johnny got his first Derby win because he obviously didn't have a mount and then he switched to Animal Kingdom. Uh, tell me about that. Were, was, were you excited for him or were you just, you know, how, how did all of that go? Well, I'm going to give you a um, even better than exciting. Um, it got to be either Wednesday or Thursday, <clears throat> and Uncle Mo went off his meds. And um, Todd was 50-50 whether we would race, and we were going to scratch on Friday. And um, the one thing I would never want, and Todd would never want, is have an incredible jockey like Johnny Velasquez just wait until um, – until, uh, you know, Friday when we make a decision and then just be out of the derby, just like I was and just like Todd was uh, with Uncle Mo. I did run Stay Thirsty, and Todd also ran Stay Thirsty. So we did run our first horse ever in the derby. We came in 13th or 14th. So, I, you know, so I did get to run in the derby, which was special. But what a lot of people don't know, and I got to give Todd, you know, 90% of the credit here was, Robbie Alvarado fell off a, a mount earlier in the week, and I think he broke his nose and wasn't sure whether he'd even be able to run Animal Kingdom. So what Todd did, uh, which I think is incredible, was on either Tuesday or Wednesday, he called up Graham Motion confidentially and said, listen, we're 50-50 on whether Uncle Mo's going to go. Um, please don't let anyone know. And of course, Graham, being such a great guy, would never do that. And just... If we scratch, Johnny's going to become available. And um, on Thursday night, when we knew we were going to scratch Uncle Mo on Friday, he confirmed that to both Graham and Johnny. And he got Johnny that mount. And uh, watching Johnny win that first derby and knowing that Todd had a big part of it by just doing the right thing um, was really, really, really special. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a story not too many people know, but very, very special. And then when they got to win the Derby together with um, Vinny Viola uh, and, and Anthony Bonomo, who were friends of mine with Always Dreaming, um, that was very special to me for a couple of reasons. One, watching Todd and Johnny win the Derby together was special. And then I was the one that introduced Vinny Viola and Anthony Bonomo to Todd Pletcher. So, I, you know, if ever, anyone asked, did I ever win a Derby before? Um, I had a vested interest in that horse. Um, I had hot held equity, um, you know, always dreaming and watching Vinny and watching Anthony and their family celebrate with Todd and Johnny. And, you know, Jimmy Coopy was part of that was really, really, really special to me. And, uh, you know, I love watching people succeed and, um, and I love watching people um, reach their dreams. As much as you love Johnny, I got to say that you you were likely a little bit uh, – you probably weren't as friendly with him uh, <laughs> or as happy with him in the jockey club when Vino Rosso got DQ'd, huh? He was on Code of Honor. You, you know, listen, Johnny is – I mean, you know, could be – I don't know, maybe the greatest jockey of all time. And, you know, listen, we've had tremendous history together, you know, and – um you know, that was, that was a situation where, you know, he was in such a tough position where, you know, he, he just won, he won the grade one um, with, you know, with uh, Vino Rosso in uh, the California um, Gold Cup. And then he rode Uncle Mo, I'm sorry, he rode Vino Rosso in the Whitney. And then he rode uh, uh, Code of Honor in the, in the um, Travers and he won the Travers. So here he is. He's got a Travers winner and he's got a, he's got loyalty to me and Todd and, you know, he's got to make a decision and, you know, listen, nine out of 10 times, he's always leaned with us and in that situation. He went with, you know, code of honor and, 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 and we kind of understood. Um, Irad gets the mount. Um, and these, these guys, 
have this incredible stretch to, and uh, you know we win. And of course, I'm happy the horse wins. Wins by a nose. Um, I ran against Johnny. Uh, Johnny versus Mike and Todd. Kind of weird for us. And then there's a claim of foul, an inquiry, and then the horse comes down. And you know, let me tell you right now, I was in Italy. I watched the race at a restaurant in Italy at about 12:30. I didn't go to sleep that night, but uh, I, I still don't think he should have can't come down. And thank God I was not at uh, Belmont that day because I don't know what I what I would have done. But um, but you know, listen. And then all of a sudden, you know, here's Irad who picks up the mount, and now it's the Breeders' Cup Classic. And you got Code of Honor with Johnny, and you got Vino Rosso. And, you know, unfortunately there, it flipped around where where Irad, you know, wins by five lengths and or four lengths, whatever. And, um, and you know, Irad was, uh, man, this was 2019. I think Irad was 24, 25. And, you know, really was, you know, wasn't, was, was the start of a, pretty great relationship now that we have with Irat and uh, things happen for a reason. I mean, you know, we love Johnny and when Johnny wins the Derby with authentic uh, probably his first two texts were from me and Todd. And, you know, he rode a horse for me in the Jeff Ruby stakes this week. And, you know, when he, when he wins on Malathot, I'm happy uh, except when it's against nest. So we still get along great. And he, you know, he roots for us. We root for him. And, you know, I mean, and, you know, he's not riding, you know, eight, nine mounts a day and he's picking and choosing his spots and following the horses. And, you know, we're all, we're all good friends, but, you know, I mean, we can't, you know, this isn't like 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, where it was Johnny on everything. So it's been a lot different. Did you, uh, did you send the stewards a Christmas card for taking Vino Rosso down? Um, no, I, uh, I sent them another card, but it definitely was not a, <laughs> a, uh, a thank you card. I mean, you know, listen, it's, it is what it is. I mean, sometimes you stay up, sometimes you don't. I mean, for me, listen, it, to me, it was, a, it was a great horse race, two horses that ran their eyeballs out, two jockeys that uh, rode, rode the hell out. And, you know, just, you know, it's why I fell in love with horse racing, watching horses compete, come down the stretch. And, uh, you know, listen, honestly, if I would have been the other way around, I would have been happy to take the win, but I would have thought it was BS anyway. Um, so I can't, you know, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I mean, um, I don't think it should have came down. Uh, but if Code of Honor would have won, I don't think it should have came down either. But, you know, sometimes it's like um, I watched the Creighton basketball game yesterday, right? I mean, tie game, you know, you know, refs have called very little fouls all game. And with one second ago in a tie game, they call a ticky tack foul that brings the San Diego state guy to the line. He hits one free throw and they go to the final four. I think that's bullshit. You know, I mean, you know, let them play it out. I mean, it, it was, it wasn't that obvious. And, uh, and I, I feel the same thing happened here. You excited about St. John's? You know what? It's uh, it's been 10 years uh, to 15 years. of the last time I've been excited about St. John's and yeah, I'm very excited about St. John's. I mean, uh, you know, this is a university that I, uh, that I, I, I went to in 87 to 91, um, the 84 team with, uh, that made the final four with Chris Mullen and Walter Berry and being a 12, 13, 14, 15 year old fan that used to take the train into the city and sit in the blue seats, um, and watch Ewing versus Mullen and pro Washington versus, uh, versus Mullen and why I wanted to go to St. John's and, you know, watching them, you know, make, you know, some bad coaching errors, um, you know, but now I think they got the Todd Pletcher of training, coaching them. Um, Rick is Rick and I have been friends for 15 years. He's a big horse guy. I'm, friend, I'm friends with his kids, especially Mike Patino. Um, I live in Florida now. I'll probably see Rick next week. I think he might be going to the Florida Derby. Um, but I'm really excited for St. John's. I'm really excited for the alumni, the fans, the students. Um, and it's about time that we get back on uh, the national stage like this program was 20 years ago. So very exciting. I'm surprised that 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 you allowed Uncle Mo to go to Coolmore, considering uh, Michael Tabor stole your silks. You know what? I mean, listen, it, it doesn't bother me. I mean, you know, Michael <laughs> Michael Tabor's a really really good guy. 
Um, he races mostly in Europe now. I tell him, but uh, you know, when when uh, you know, I, I call I, you know, I call him Mr. Tabor, and I uh, I really respect the uh, Magner and and uh, um, and Tabor and Smith and and the Coolmore operation. Um, I like to make fun of them a little bit and have some fun with them. And uh, you know, I mean, um, in fact, when we're partners on a horse, I always ask Ashling because we sub silks. I said, listen, can we please, please, please use the Tabor silks so the horse is always running in blue and orange. And when I see Tabor, I saw him at the Breeders' Cup, and uh, his blue and orange silks came out. I'm like, I, why couldn't you just pick your own original silks? I don't understand why you have to copy this and stuff like that. <laughs> and then I might, I might bust his chops and say, well, I win the dirt races and you win the turf races. But um, it, it is a lot of fun. And, you know, you guys know that the blue and orange really is. You know, I was a Met fan. I was a Bronco fan. And blue and orange me means a lot to me. And I, I also said that my grandmother couldn't see well. So blue and orange are very bright. She could see those colors. So it was pretty easy making them blue and orange. Are you, are you a Broncos fan because they were blue and orange or was there some other reason? You know what? I was a seven year old kid in 77 and, uh, and, uh, it was the orange crush and the jets and giants stunk. And, uh, I didn't know really who to root for. And the Raiders were really good and the Cowboys were good and, and the Steelers were good and the Broncos just started off really well. And, I became a Bronco fan, and six years later, they drafted John Elway, and um, I just stayed a fan, and uh, uh, it was good to see Elway win Super Bowls in 98, 99, but, you know, they were blue and orange, too, so it just, uh, I just enjoyed the blue and orange, and, uh, you know, but really it was for the Mets, because in 86, that was a team I followed. I was a 16-year-old kid. We went to all the games. I went to game seven. I sat in the press box. Um, you know, I, I'd sit in the you know, the, 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 the highest level seats and cheer them on. And, you know, I, I, I don't think I've watched 162 innings of a baseball game over the last 10 years, but back then I watched 162 games and we watched every one. I listened to them on the radio and um, I was a really, really big fan. Like obviously uncle Mo and stay thirsty and Vino Rosso are, are super important horses um, in your stables history. But it, I, you got to think that Nona Mia, means a lot to you not only named after your grandmother but also uh the dam of outwork uh tell me a little bit about nona mia you know nona no mia was a horse that bruce levine picked out um got um for, for two hundred thousand dollars and i think she was um she was third in the frisette um and she lost to awesome rear and devil may care uh by a length so not 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 bad at all she would have made it at belmont by about 10 and a half or 11 lengths. And, you know, I named the horse after my grandmother, which was really, really special. And she really had a passion. I mean, she didn't, you know, she didn't, she didn't speak English. She didn't write English. She was here 50 years and, uh, and naming a horse after her and then, you know, bringing it to uncle Mo and not too many people know this outwork was the first winner of uncle Mo's stallion career. Um, he was 17 hands and he and he won it five furlongs at Keeneland uh, in the I think it was the third week of April, and uh, and he wound up making the Derby. He won the Wood Memorial, but for me that was really special because it was my silks, it was Todd, it was Johnny was on him, it was after a mare that named after my 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 grandmother, and and I named him Outwork. And uh, I think uh, you know that one of my things is work ethic and. You know, no one's ever going to outwork me. And I always talk to people. And listen, even if you don't know what you do, do something 18 hours a day for seven days a week. And I promise you, you'll be successful um, as long as you stay consistent to doing that. And uh, very, very, very special for so many, so many reasons. And, uh, um, you know, you know, my grandmother was sick like the last 10 or 15 years of her life. But so we were blessed to have her around for so long. And um uh, you know, she, 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 the last derby she went to was Vino Rosso's. She wasn't able to go to the classic to watch Vino Rosso. And uh, something ironic and something weird. She passed away in 2020. Um, she passed away May 2nd, 2020. Um, it was a Saturday morning. My mom called me. I was three miles away. Uh, she passed away in her sleep at home. And uh, it was Kentucky Derby Day. <laughs> And it was COVID and there was no derby. 
And I just find it so ironic. So someone who used to just go to the races with me and wear her blue and orange hat and watch races at Finger Lakes happened to pass away uh, on the dirt on the first Saturday in May when there was no Kentucky Derby. And, you know, I, I know every day I'm in the Derby, you know, it's a celebration of her being there to six of them. She wasn't there for dynamic one, which was a year later, which was pretty special because it was the year anniversary. And um, she got us together uh, by having us in the Derby. And, you know, if I'm ever fortunate or blessed to, to win the Kentucky Derby, I mean, that first Saturday in May is going to have a, a much deeper meeting um, than it does right now, by the way. I know the media really ran with the idea that you wanted to win the Belmont more than you wanted to win the Derby. Is that, is that true or is it just kind of convenient considering you're, you know, born well, and raised in New York? Yeah, well, it's true, but that changed in June of last year when I won the Belmont Stakes. So, <laughs> um, you know, now I want to win the Kentucky Derby. Um, you know, listen, I, I mean, I did want to win the Belmont Stakes because I, and I wanted to win the Wood Memorial and I wanted to win the Cigar Mile and I wanted to win all the races in New York because that's where I was from. I was a kid from Queens who took the train to either Belmont or took the train to Aqueduct or walked to Aqueduct and, you know, and didn't have a car until I was 21 that could get us to get me to Saratoga because it was three hours away and I didn't have a car that can go three hours. So yeah, being, being from New York and, you know, going there at 13 and 14 years old and having jockeys like uh, E.T. Bird and uh, David Noose <laughs> and, and those, those type of jockeys. Yeah, that was that was the dream. And, uh, you know, and that was fulfilled. And, you know, but, you know, now, yeah, I want to I want I want to win the Derby. But, you know, listen, you know, Jonathan, I don't, I don't want to sound. um you know, I don't know what the word is. Um, I've won a lot of big races. I've been blessed to win a lot of big races. And I love winning and I love having fun. And I love sharing success. And I love watching other people win. And I love watching, you know, winning in other people's eyes. So for me, you know, I've won the Alabama twice. I've won the coaching club twice. I've won the Wood Memorial twice. I, um, you know, I, these are dream races that I, I'm, I mean, I won the Breeders' Cup Juvenile twice. I mean, you know, to win these races once in a lifetime is, is, a, is, a, is a billion or one. I mean, to sit here talking to you, at, you know, been in the game for, you know, 16, 17 years, 18 years, and to be talking about winning these races for a second time or, you know, there's a chance, depending on what happens Saturday, Forte might be the favorite in the Derby. It's the favorite today. Um, 2011, I had the favorite for the Derby, and he didn't even get a start. He didn't even get behind the gate. So we all know that, you know, I don't think I'm looking for the Derby favorite. I think I'm looking for the Derby winner right now. And, uh, you know, listen, I, I'm, I'm humbled. Um, I'm blessed. I'm still driven. Um, I still, I still compete at the highest level. Uh, I wake up every day, you know, thinking that, you know, I need to work really hard today because, you know, somebody out there is going to be working harder than me. Uh, I encourage people. I surround myself with people who care, people who are passionate, people that work hard. You know, I drive Ed Rosen crazy when we have, uh, you know, you know, uh, um, when we have five starts on a Saturday, we have two wins, two seconds, and one horse runs out of the money, and he's all excited. And I'm like, what happened to the horse that ran out of the money? And Ed goes, ah, oh, I knew you were going to say that. And uh, But it's just my nature. It's just my nature. Um, and everything great is good enough. You know, my goal today is to be better than I was yesterday. My goal tomorrow is to be better than I was um, today. And, uh, you know, I still, I still am driven to – to be better. And, uh, you know, when I talk to other people, um, you know, you have to have internal drive. You have to ins uh, have your own aspirations. And at the end of the day, I compete with myself and it's, it's, and it's my goals and what I want to accomplish and surrounding myself with people that have the same DNA and the same personality and want more out of their life also. So, 
um, I'm a good fit for people like that. And uh, they motivate me as much as I motivate them. Mike, if someone crazy offered you a hundred million dollars for Forte, would you sell them? No, no. Now, if he was retired and someone offered me a hundred million dollars, <laughs> and uh, but I, I listen, I keep a piece of all my stallions. I mean, you know, any any farm that gets Forte will have in his deal that we have the option to run him as four years old. So. There will be no deal done that says, oh, he has to retire at the end of the year. Now, I'm not saying he's not going to retire at the end of the year, but there's not going to be like we have this set up. It's done. It will be open and and, and we'll make that decision. But um, every every farm that talks to me about stallions, whether it's two or three, um, it's very important to me for the, me to even be considered where – I get to choose whether they run at four years old, not you. And the farms know me by now. That's something that's always in my deal. I got to tell you, you know, I don't think it, ha- I, I love that you say that and that that's going to be on the table. Cause we don't get to see that enough. Unfortunately, just the, 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 the economics of racing, but like you think about gun runner, you think about Vino Rosso, you think about frosted, these horses that were allowed to come back as four-year-olds, what they turn into. And we don't get to see it that much. And I'm a fan of the game too. I want to see greatness on the racetrack. And um, I think, you know, an opportunity, a chance to see Forte at four is an opportunity to see greatness. Yeah. I, I think it's a couple of things, Jonathan, like uncle Mo needed to be retired at three, you know, he shouldn't have, maybe he should have never even came back. And then he ran like 11th in the Breeders' cup. He needed to go stay thirsty, came back at four, you know, Rosso came back at four, you know, nest is a Philly. She's coming back at four. Um, outwork got injured after the wood. I mean, it really depends on the horse, the health of the horse. And, and listen, sometimes economics do play a role. And as much as a fan hates to hear that, you know, you can't insure a horse for $50 million. I mean, you know, God forbid. I mean, you can't, the purses make no sense. As much as I would love to do it for the fan, I mean, God forbid something happened at the racetrack and I bought the horse back. I don't know. I I I, I think I'd, I I would be devastated. I would be it would be be very hard for me to get over that. But you know, I mean, look at life is good. He came back at four. Look at, um, you know, obviously, uh, flight line. He came back at four. You know, I mean, listen, this comes down to the sport and the stupidity of the sport. You know, do do something for all the horses. I mean, why do I have to go to Saudi Arabia for $20 million? Why do I have to go to Dubai for $10 million? You know, why, I mean, why can't the United States have races like this? Why can't we do that? Why can't we have an older horse division? Why can't we make, why can't we have a triple crown for four-year-olds? Why can't we get creative? Because we're, we're, we're lazy. And if we're not lazy, we're incompetent. One of the other. You know, Mike, in our conversations we've had just about racing and 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 just in general, like the one thing that I've gathered is is talking to you is it's very easy to see why you were successful in business because you have an outstanding marketing mind, but you you ask a lot of questions while other people accept answers as that's just because that's how it is. Um, where do you find the biggest gaps we have from a marketing standpoint in this game? Well, when you when you say a marketing standpoint, you that's almost insinuating that we actually do fucking marketing. We don't do any marketing. Let's just be honest. We don't. Um, we've never marketed the sport. Okay. We don't teach um, the younger generation how racing can be great. We don't celebrate the millennials or Gen Z. Um, we don't educate owners on how to be owners. Um, you'll get a bloodstock agent that gets a new fish or new owner, whatever you want to call them. And the guy wants to spend 10 million and within three sales, 10 million is spent and the guy got nothing for it. So he's out of the game. Um, so we just lost an owner there. Uh, we don't teach people how to gamble. Um, you would be an expert on running a gambling class, but, but Jonathan, you might be too advanced. Like we need gambling for dummies. Like where's the book gambling for dummies versus I like the number eight because my birthday is the eighth. Or I like the you know I like the color, or I like the name. I mean, let's teach people how to handicap and let's simplify handicapping. I mean, you know, my daughter is in first grade. Um, 
her reading level is getting closer to mine, by the way, because I had a 2-2 grade point average in college, but she couldn't read. Someone had to teach her. You know, why don't we teach people? Why doesn't the track and why doesn't the industry and why doesn't the jockey goal, uh, jockey club and why doesn't NTRA and why don't these other organizations and the Breeders' Cup all work together? Why doesn't Naira work together with Churchill and work together with Astronic Group and work together with Tampa? No, we don't do that. We don't work because that would be too smart. There's what is that 10, 12 billion dollars a year betting horse racing? Yep. It should be 50 billion. You know, listen, if I could buy the whole sport, like the NFL or UC uh, UFC, or I'd buy the entire sport, you know. But you know, listen, Churchill's a public company and they're gonna do what their shareholders want. Naira can't get out of its way. Um, I don't know, the Stronic Group. I mean, you know, when, when California has four horses in a stake and the trainers all Bob Baffert. What the hell does that say about the sport? You know, I mean, Tampa has tremendous potential. It's a really, really nice track. Um, you know, it's 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 got a great surface. It's definitely not maximized. Um, you know, and, I mean, listen, I mean, we, you know, I mean, despite everything we do to hurt the sport, ruin the sport, it lives on. It just shows you the power of the brand. Um, aqueduct. I mean, listen, I've said this, you bought, you bring a friend to aqueduct, you know, if he, if he doesn't get, you know, his car stolen or, or get dirt all over his clothes, you know, he never comes back. You know, Saratoga is like a fair. You'd come back to that. How do you spend money? How do you invest? You know, I mean, every brand I built, I invested in the brand. Gambling is, I don't know if you know, but gambling is taking off in the, in the United States. I think it's legal in 45 States. How can we not have a bigger piece of this pie? I mean, we're only growing by accident. That's the only, you know, you know, you know, the funniest thing is when I watch FanDuel and three damn races are going off at the same time. Here's Gulfstream, Aqueduct, and Tamper all going off at, at, at 247. You couldn't be any dumber. Like, what if we did this? 101, 105, 110, 115, 120, 125. What if, we, I mean, what if we all work together? Like, they don't care. I mean, listen, it, 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 it's, it's, it's so, it's so ridiculous that, you know what? I would love to change it, you know, but you know, it's funny. I'm a pretty big owner. There's a lot of big boards out there. Wow. For some reason, nobody asked me to be on a board. Nobody <laughs> wants me on a board. No, I'll tip absolutely over a table. not. I'll tip over no. a table. Are you kidding me? You no. know, I will expose you. I'll embarrass you. You know, they, every, they all want me part of the game because I go to the sale and I spend $20 million and, 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 and I get outbid on other horses. So that's another $20 million I added. But, you know, they, they, and they don't mind when I win racing because I think they think I'm good for racing. Uh, but uh, they, I'm good because I buy horses and I, I care about the sport. I'm passionate. But... But, you know, what about, uh, you know, like Road to the Derby? I thought they were going to do a Netflix show. Where'd that go? I mean, I haven't heard from them. I got the favorite, you know? Um, yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm supposed to, too. So, I, I, you know. Yeah, well, where's that? When's that coming yeah. out? After the Derby? <laughs> what happened there? You know? I mean, listen, listen. At the end of the day, I think it starts with the Jockey Club. And honestly, I don't even know what they do. And, I, you know, listen, you could, I could bring up every board member on there, but, you know, five or six of them, my friends, you know, I'm not talking behind my back when I say, what the hell do you guys do? But it's embarrassing. I know a bunch of people on Naira board. What the hell's that? I met with the CEO of um, Churchill. I mean, he's concerned about Churchill and he's a public C CEO. So I understand that. Stronic group. I don't even know who runs that anymore. Um, they're nice to me, but I mean, come on. It's, 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 it's Mickey Mouse. I mean, it's, 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 it's mismanaged and, you know, if they all wanted to get it better, they all know I'm capable of making it better. I mean, I'll be the commissioner or uh, the grand poop or racing. I don't care. I mean, what's my vested interest? I got free time. I work 24 hours a day. I can find another half hour, but they don't want it, you know, and, you know, it, 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 it is a shame. And, and, and the game is just going to stay stagnant. And you know what? They're going to say, well, the game is doing so well. I mean, the game could be three times the size in, in, in six years. The pie can be so much bigger. 
and they just don't get it. You know, so is it naiveness? Is it stubbornness? I don't know. Is it stupidity? Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's, I, I, well, I think the, the elevator answer is, is that there's so many different factions that are very satisfied with what they're getting and they don't want to take any risks that would lessen what they're getting. And it, it's going to take some creativity to, to make the pie bigger uh, and, and, and them trust that they're still going to get their same piece. And that's, that's where it all kind of starts for me. Yeah, I, I think, I think you're being extremely polite. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you why. If I've seen attempts or conversations about how we can improve this game and how we can market this game and how we could change this game. And then we decide that's not what we should be doing. Then I would agree with you. Um, I don't see any effort. Zero. I don't see any effort. I see people pretend to discuss, but there is no energy going into this. None. I mean, absolutely not. So next time there's a meeting where you think that people are looking at the pros and the cons and weighing it, I would, really, hey, you know what? Why don't we have 1% of the owner's purse, the trainer's purse, the, the purse at the track, the handle, uh, into this big marketing fund. 1% of all the sales um, be taxed, 1%, and all go into this big national marketing fund. And let's raise $100 million with this little 1%. And then let's hire a team managed by these major bodies, the top five owners, the top five farms in Kentucky, the top five tracks, and people that have a vested interest. And take that $100 million, which is, 1% of what we all, in fact, you know what? Bill me 2%. I'll, I'll, I'll be billed 2%. I'll double what everybody else puts in. And now let's take that hundred million and let's invest in horse racing. Okay. It's simple. Mm -hmm. I came up with that in eight seconds. These guys <laughs> haven't come up with that in 50 years. Simple. Yeah. I, I, I think, I think that scares people. Yeah. Wrong. Wrongfully. I think it but, scares but, 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 people. But scares them. Why? They might lose their job. They might be proved to be stupid. They might be proved to be incompetent. They might be proved to not be that smart. I, I don't know. What does it scare people? Anybody yeah, I think it's like better than if you're not going forward, you're going backwards in life. Stop. And you know what? Let me tell you why it's easy for my kennel, to, my stable to get better. Because I am trying different things. And I am hiring different people. And I am working to be better. And I am not staying stagnant. So that's why I'm getting better. And if everybody wants to have their same formula and do the same things and do the, that's it. Then let them do that. And I'm going to have more success. That's all, you know, but I root for other people. You know, I root for other people. The other people can, what do you call it? They've given up on trying to do things differently. Um, and that happens in corporate America. That happens with public companies. That happens There's politics and there's bureaucracy. This sport isn't big enough to have the politics and bureaucracy it has. It's bullshit. Naira cares about Naira. The gaming commission is clueless. You know, the Naira board doesn't really make decisions. Hello to all my friends on the Naira board. Um, you know, Churchill only cares about Churchill. Tell me why the Kentucky Derby's purse is not $10 million. Tell me. I know why, Jonathan. Why isn't the Kentucky Derby purse $10 million? Uh Cheryl, I mean, I, I, it's, 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 it fucking doesn't have to be because they're going to get 160,000 people anyway, and 20 horses are going to run in it. Let me tell you right now, I might start a race on the first Saturday in May at Tampa, Tampa Racetrack for $20 million for one, one year, $20 million. I will show Churchill that nobody will go to their race. Nobody. $20 million, nobody will go to their race. Nobody. Todd Pletcher will, and I will have seven horses uh, and all Bob Bafford and Steve Asmussen and, and Cox will all run in my $20 million race. So that's why there's no threat. There was a yeah. brand I went after one time. It's called Gatorade. And everybody says, oh shit, same old sport drink, 50 years, same old science, high sodium, artificial sugar, artificial sweeteners, artificial flavors, artificial colors. Well, why don't we give it to our kids? 
Because in 50 years, nobody came out with something different. And then I came around and I created this brand body on and I went natural sugar and natural uh, sweeteners and natural flavors. And I put coconut water in it and I used potassium instead of sodium. And the category was five billion dollars when I got in in 2011, 12. Well, today, guess what? Gatorade should send me a fucking thank you letter. The category was five billion for 15 years. Now it's twelve billion dollars. And you know what? Gatorade, instead of having four billion of the five, now has eight billion of the twelve. So they double their market share. And 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 Body Armor's got two, two, two and a half billion. So I grew the category. It's the same thing that can happen in horse racing. You can get a lower percent of a bigger pie. If I told you, hey, I'm gonna give you, you know, one percent of a billion or a hundred percent of a million. Which one do you want? 1% of a billion. Okay. That's it. <laughs> okay. There's your $10 million, by the way. Congratulations. <laughs> you know, versus $1 million. People aren't that it's common. It's, it's, it, you know, it's common sense. I mean, you know, now, you know, and listen, I have these talks all the time and, 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 and everybody listens and shakes their head. You know, what do I want to do? I mean, what, what can I do? Can I, can I get rid of the jockey club? Can I overtake Naira? You know, Churchill's got a $9 billion market cap. You know, can I put $100 million into the stock and get a board seat? Can I, you know, go buy Tampa? Um, can someone give me Stella's number? Maybe I'll call her today. Can I go talk to Belinda and try to buy uh, the Strana Group? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I'm available. Everybody has my number. Uh, no. Jake, Jake, I do think that you... Wants to, uh, you can be my agent. If anybody wants to give me my number, let me know. Does Naira want to go private? I'll, I'll, I'll run everything in Belmont, Saratoga, and... And we'll make this, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, Nairo, instead of being owned by the state, will be a private company. Let's do it. I do think that, that someone who is not, who's willing to challenge the status quo, owning a racetrack or an ADW or a racetrack, I think, I think something could, good could come from that. I really do. Yeah. yeah I, 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 if, 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 if I can get into a track or something like that, I would show them by example on how, easy this is and then they would have to follow suit um because i would change the game you know i would i would change the game and um you know but right now like listen i've had so many other businesses and i still do and i really just enjoy going to the races so you know jonathan even in like 2015 16 and 17 you know i got to the point where do I really want to be in this sport? And I think the harder I tried to change it, you know, the less happy I became. And I can't lie here. It actually sucked me in. So I started to say, you know what? If I have to play by your rules, I'm just going to play by your rules even better than you do. And I think I've done that the last five years. Um, but I actually think playing by my rules would actually have more success across for the trainers for the workers at the backstretch, for the horses, for the industry, for TV. I mean, I mean, we can't even get a TV contract that works for everybody. And, and, you know, you got FanDuel versus Naira and Naira versus Express Bet. And, you know, nobody wants to work together. All they want to do is steal from each other. Nobody wants to grow the pie. Nobody wants to grow the pie. And if the pie grows, we're all winners. And, uh, you know, you know, and, and why isn't there a commissioner? Who's going to allow a commissioner? Who's going to, who, who's going to allow a commissioner? I'm going to make myself the commission. What am I going to do? You know, <laughs> what am I going to do? Mike, did you get along with Gatorade when, or were you guys enemies during all of this, your, your business stuff? The Gatorade hated me more than anybody in the world. Um, what, I mean, they sent me nasty, I call them love letters, but Everything I did from a marketing wise, I called them my they, my granddad's sports ring. They sent me a letter on that. Um, I said they were two and, a, two and a half times the electrolytes, which was true. They sent me a letter on that. They tried to sue me numerous times. Every time they sent me a letter, we were doing 4 million minus 12. And every time I got depressed about losing $12 million, I'd get a love letter from Gatorade. And I said, you know what? These guys might know better than me that I'm onto something. Because why are they paying attention to me? Like, like, so I would just shred their letters or frame them as motivation. 
So you know what? I got news to you. Now that I sold to Coke and now that they double their business in 10 years, I think that they love me. I think they really do love me that I made them, you know, listen, everybody needs a rivalry when, you know, whether it's the Yankees and the Red Sox or whether it's, you know, Michigan versus Ohio state, um, you know, or, you know, uh, you know, football teams. I mean, you know, everybody needs a rivalry. So Gatorade didn't have a rivalry, you know, and, and maybe horse racing needs a rivalry. I mean, look at live golf right now. You know, I mean, Hey, a lot of top players are going to play there. You know, oh, that's a lot of controversy. Well, you know what? I don't know. I mean, I love the Masters. I love the U.S. Open. But if I had a son that was a golfer and he was like in the middle of a pack and someone's going to offer him guaranteed money, you know what? I think I might take the money, you know? So, um, and I think Churchill, you know, I got to say, somebody can make a threat to the Triple Crown if they wanted to. First of all, why is it 20 horses at Churchill? It's stupid. It should be 14. It's number one. Why should the Preakness be two years after? It's done. Who? Nobody, the only person that wants to win the Preakness is the Kentucky Derby winner. Todd Pletcher's never won the Preakness. He's only run with it after he's had a horse here. There's no reason to run in the Preakness if you don't win the Derby. You, know, you might as well wait five weeks, which is right for the horse, and try to win the Belmont. So why not spread this out? Let's go you know, four weeks out, let's go, let's go May, uh, uh, beginning of June and, you know, and end of June, right before 4th of July. And let's space out the triple crown instead of a five week period, let's make it eight weeks. And I guarantee the extra two weeks between the Preakness and the Derby, you'll get seven, eight horses versus two horses or three horses. And the Belmont, There'll be eight weeks apart, so the horses will have to run somewhere. So they'll have to find a spot. So there's so much. And nowadays, it's tough. You know, look at these NBA players that don't want to play back-to-back, you know, because they train so hard and they work so hard. You know, I mean, which, you know, I think is wimpy, by the way. That's another story. But asking a horse to come back, you know, after having a prep four weeks before the derby and then coming back and two weeks after the derby and then three weeks after that, the, the Belmont, Maybe that made sense in 1950, 1960, 1970. Maybe that's why horses like Justify, you know, <laughs> you know, they win it and they just move on. I don't know. I don't think it needs to be done this way. I think it could still be the first Saturday in May and add four weeks in four weeks and get us till June 30th. You know, I mean, I mean, JK, this is not rocket science. This is simple, simple common sense, you know, and, and having an older horse division and increasing the purses. You want more horses to come back at four? Let these four-year-old races be worth a lot more money. Make it that owners make more money in racing their horses versus retiring their horses. And when you grow the sport, purses should be, a maiden race should be, in five years, a maiden race should be $150,000 and stakes should be five to $10 million. And the handle should be $22 million, 22, I mean, 22 billion, you know, and there should be a Netflix series and there should be Saturday at the races and JK, you can be the host if you want. And a couple of my other friends that I really like in racing and, uh, and you could cover every race, start at one o'clock with Gulfstream and Aqueduct and end at six with Santa Anita and just have it make it stake Saturday and have a full day of coverage. Why not? There's about 700 Sports stations on now, and we can't even get a regular station for horse racing. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm watching fucking cornhole on ESPN eight. Come on, it's 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 embarrassing. Mike, I got I I, I got to ask you before I before we get out of here. I got a couple more for you. The first one is my 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 11 year old. He he's been asking me to get this this prime drink, and I told him I, I said I can't do that to my man Mike. I, I we can't do it, but I can't find it anywhere. By the way, what's going on with this? You know what? It's 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 great marketing. Um, you got a YouTuber, um, um, Logan Paul, I think it is, and the bottom line is it's it's just a TikTok sensation. It tastes terrible. The kids want to buy it and trade the colors of it 
Um, it's amazing how, and they can't make enough of it. Now it's growing really, really quick, but it's a fact. It's just, it, your son's not even looking to drink it. He just needs a couple of colors, but you know, with social media, I don't, I don't, I don't even know if horse racing knows that we have social media now. They probably don't know what TikTok is. They probably don't know what Instagram is. They probably don't know. I mean, they probably know what Facebook is. Um, they know Twitter because it's an opportunity for people just to curse each other out and tell each other they suck. And they, so they love Twitter. That's great. Um, but they don't make the fun. The sport's not fun. It's not educational. So that's it. They did some great marketing, you know, and, uh, and, and you know what? Horse racing and TikTok and behind the scenes and Instagram. Um, this can be a great sport. Um, there's a lot of personalities on this racetrack. And, um, and we just got the same old boring stories. You know, hey, Mike, what do you think about Forte? And what do you think about that? I mean, I mean, I get news here. You know, and my daughter loves it, by the way. Joya, I mean, you know, uh, she, 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 she sees a camera. She runs to it. And the camera loves her, by the way. And uh, uh, she's far from shy. And, you know, if you don't interview her, she's going to run right up and ask for an interview. But, you know, I told her at the, at the Derby, if we make the Derby, she's going to undermine you know, me and any horse we have running that day, I might keep her home. She gets so much attention, but you know what? People love that. People love a seven-year-old girl who cheers, any seven-year-old girl that cheers or any young boy that cheers. You know, why can't we, you know, many of these trainers have kids. Many of these jockeys have kids. Many of these jockeys are kids. There's so many great stories in racing that just don't get told. And, uh, and the stories that need to be told need to be more mainstreamable and it's more bad news than good news. Like, like, why don't we share some good news? I mean, um, you know, everybody has a great story, man. And you know what? I got news to you for the shy, quiet trainers or owners. You know what? We have a responsibility to the fans, you know, to do an interview. We have a responsibility to the fans to, you know, you know, to be vocal. I, I think one of the things I, I, I think I've, I've done, and, and honestly, it was frowned upon, you know, you know, I, in 2010, 11, 12, when I came on the scene, I mean, I, I, I would bring down the rafters at Saratoga when my horse won, you know, you know, we, we watched these old blue, blue bluebirds just look at me like, like, like I'm supposed to golf clap here or something like that, or tip my hat. And I'm like, fuck no, I'm from fucking Queens, man. We, we, we hug, we high five, and I got news for you. When I see other people win and I see the emotion and the passion of others winning in such a crazy way, I love that, man. I love it. Even if I'm in the race, I love it because that's what the sport can do. We got to bring up the passion of winning and the passion um, of how special this is. You know, I'm not – when we celebrate, I'm not – you know, I'm not taunting the other owners. I'm not, you know, you know, when they, when I clap for them, it's just about winning these special races and really enjoying themselves and making it a friends and family event like no other. And um, I wish we, you know, listen, if I'm in a race and you beat me, I want that owner to go as crazy as possible, cheer as loud as he can and do your best to be louder than my group. And uh, I will applaud you for that. I don't think you got to worry about it. I'm not worried this weekend. I'm not worried about the post. I just wanted to let you know that he, he, it's not his style. Doesn't, it's not going to be a problem for the 11 hole. I'm not, I'm listen, you know, people have asked me 10 times, some smart people turn dumb and asked me, are you going to scratch and go to the Arkansas Derby of the wood? And I said, why? And they said, well, you got post 11. And what I said was, I just found out that this year they're going to run 20 in the Derby. I mean, post 11, I mean, come on. It's a, I know it comes up quick, so what? I mean, you know what? You know, Todd wasn't, I mean, we weren't begging for the 11. We weren't looking for it, but you know what? He's got to have more experience. He's got to figure out how to, you know, what do you call it? And, and by the way, if he wins a two to five, we're going to go crazy. And if, and if somehow he gets beat, you know what? You know, the one time he got beat in the Sanford, we learned a lot about him. You know, he got dirt in his face for the first time. He didn't know what to do, and he's won five in a row since. So if he happens to get beat here and he goes on to win the next three, I'm going to be okay with that. So 
I want him to get a wide experience. I want him to get in certain trouble. I want Irad to do things with him that maybe he's not used to or never thought he had to do because I got news here. He might get the one or the 20 post at Churchill and he's going to have to figure that out too. So I'm fine with the post. You can't control that. I'd much, I'd much prefer him be out there than drawn on the inside. I, 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 I hate the rail. Bad you know? things happen down there. I don't, I don't, I'd rather no, be I, in the clear. I, I don't disagree except that again, you know, probably the miles, the race should be, you know, again, golf stream. Here you go again. Um, probably the race should be a mile and three sixteenths. Okay. Um, they should probably move it up a little bit. Um, Louisiana Derby just moved there. So with three sixteenths. Um, um, and it would have the starting post further back. I mean, actually the rail here is not bad because once you break the gate, you're making a left turn. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it comes up so quick here. So, um, I don't know. I mean, listen, at the end of the day, we're married to tradition. Tradition was probably wrong back then. I mean, I don't know. I mean, the NFL has evolved, right? We don't, they don't wear leather helmets anymore, do they? Okay. <laughs> um, baseball, uh, you know, they, they, you know, uh, basketball, they don't wear the short shorts anymore, right? They, they stopped that, right? The equipment that uh, players that we trained in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, I think these kids have more modern equipment, right? Um, why is this sport the same the same as it was years ago and the same, you know, tradition and same, you know, uh, I doubt what Arnold Palmer used is what Tiger Woods and, uh, and Rory McIlroy used as clubs. I mean, the balls are different, right? I mean, the bats are different. Uh, uh, come on, man. I mean, we got to evolve, man. This sport is not evolving. And if it wasn't for the passion of the ones that love it, and if it wasn't for, um, you know, how much people really love the game, we wouldn't be here. I mean, we wouldn't be here. I mean, you know, you know, I mean, this is boxing. And, you know, now we have an opportunity to be what's bigger, uh, JK, boxing or uh, UFC? UFC. Okay. Well, you know what? Maybe we should look at horse racing on how to make it UFC and not stay as boxing, you know? And right now we're just boxing. Baseball's in trouble. I mean, who the hell wants to watch a baseball game for five and a half hours? You know, who wants to watch 10 pitching changes? Who wants to watch the guy shake him off 10 times? Who wants to watch, you know, uh, the manager come out numerous times? You know, I mean, you know, you go to a baseball game, you start at 730, you might get home at one. I mean, it's so stupid. I mean, they're in trouble. You know, so the sport has to evolve and they better do it quickly. And, um, you know, listen, I know, I know David O'Rourke. I know, I know the CEO of, uh, um, uh, of, uh, of Churchill. And uh, I, I know, I know of Stella. I'll have lunch with her. I live an hour and a half away. I mean, Belinda and the CEO there, uh, Stronic, they can all, what do you call it? I know every farm in Kentucky, um, whether it's Lane's End, Coolmore, Spendthrift, uh, Gainsway, Windstar, they all know me. I mean, if they want to change the game, they know where to come. Chalky Club, I'm available. I mean, I don't know. Maybe JK, put me on the on the on the on the on the Jockey Club uh, uh, board to be a member. No one's ever asked me. Let's see if I get a vote. Let's see if I get a vote. Um, you could be my agent of being on my board. See see who <laughs> votes for me. I got you. The last one I want to get you, Mike, before we get out of here is uh, Jacob West wanted to ask you about the coffee that you spilt in the middle of bidding on a million-dollar horse at uh, Keeneland. Well, I, I think he misunderstood. What happened was we bid on the million-dollar horse, and I threw the coffee at him. But I made it seem like a spill uh, strategically. I mean, I mean, listen, when, when, I, when I go to these sales, I mean, I'm hyper to begin with. Um, I walk in with, like, three different drinks, five different books. Um, I you know, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm a, uh, I'm crazy. I mean, and, and everyone around me knows it. Um, my mind works way differently than everybody else. So I'm doing so many things at once. And, you know, the beauty of, of having this big team is the ability to ask Todd Pletcher's opinion and Jake West's opinion and Danielle and Madison, their opinion and Alex and Jason and Jim Martin um, and Ed Rosen. What, what about his opinion? And, 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 you know, listen, it's, it's, you know, I take a lot in and, you know, listen, looking at a horse and bidding on a horse, you know, it's like, it's like an auto auction. I mean, it's subjective. Uh, you know, we think the horse is worth for a hundred and we get it for a hundred. We think the horse is worth a hundred and he sells for $2 million. Like, like what the hell just happened? 
you know? So, um, so, you know, listen, I spill, I spill a lot of things and, uh, <laughs> but it's always fun. I mean, we have, we really have a good time and, uh, uh, the team is amazing. Um, I really had a great team time with them and I really, I really want to win for them. I mean, you know, they, they call that, um, that group that, uh, uh, Baffert has the Avengers. So I needed to come up with a nickname for our team. And I wanted something really cool and really special. And I thought about Ed Rosen and Danielle from Long Island and Jake once somewhere in Kentucky. And Alex's dad was a jockey, a great jockey. And Todd was from Texas. And Jim Mont was a cop. And Madison's from Austin. And Jason's from Texas. And um, I'm going to go with the name, The Misfits. Um, um, from like the Rudolph the Red Nose Reindeer, the the Misfit Toys. Uh, we're a bunch of weird different pieces that shouldn't even be in this game, um, that are in this game, but we're all working together. We all have different personalities. We all come in different shapes and sizes. Um, there are certain people on my team that when I want to look tall with, I take pictures with them. Uh, if I want to look skinny, I take pictures with those people. And if I want to look young, I take a picture with Todd Pletcher. And everybody says, hey, Mike, your dad looks great there. So um, it's a lot of fun, man. It's a lot of fun. We, we do laugh a lot, but they work really, 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 really hard. Um, Saturday morning, Forte worked at 645. Todd said, perfect work, sent me a text. I sent it to the team. Seven people by 7 o'clock all responded. Awesome, great news. Everybody's sitting there working together. Um, it's a great team. And then. Um, and it's a lot of fun. And as I said, when I started, uh, success is best when shared. And um, that's what I plan on doing the rest of my life. Well, Mike, we, we appreciate you taking the time. I'm, we're rooting like hell for you on Saturday. You, the Misfits, Forte, the whole uh, Joya. We want to get her, uh, you know, get her on camera. So we'll, we'll be rooting for the 11 horse uh, in the Florida Derby. Well, I appreciate it, Jonathan. appreciate what you do. And, uh, you know, let's, uh, I know you're one of the, the many people, especially in the media, that really gets it and wants to make sure the sport uh, moves forward. And, uh, you know, you and your, your, your entourage of some of the great people in the sport, you know, you guys know it better than, than we do on what needs to be done. And uh, you guys are the great marketers. And uh, we actually make your job very difficult. And uh, um, I try to do my part. And, you know, you guys keep pushing me to do as much as I can for this sport. And don't be afraid to push other owners. And if anybody gives you an issue, uh, give me their number. I'll call them and they'll do the, I, I promise you they'll do what I say. All right. I appreciate you, Mike. Good luck this weekend. All right. Take care. Bye. Okay. Talk soon. The first time I met Mike, um, and got to talk to him, you know, I'd see him on TV and I'd see all these things, but like really got to talk to him. You get the impression immediately why he has had the success that he's had in life and in business. He asks a lot of questions um, and he doesn't really take, you know, one of my favorite things about him, he doesn't really take that, oh, that's just not how we do it, answers uh, as, as an answer. He, he, he wants to, to explore and he wants to learn and, and, and it's, uh, it's, and he's very enthusiastic and it's, it's, it, you can see why it's, it's inspiring for me, to be honest. It makes you, makes you kind of want to, to, uh, work a little bit harder, you know? Um, hearing him say, you know, in this conversation, you know, do anything for 18 hours a day and you'll be pretty damn good at it. And uh, I think oftentimes we sometimes say to ourselves, oh, we ran out of time or I don't have time to do that or oh, it's a lot of work. But, you know, it's pretty much true. You dedicate yourself to something, you can figure it out. I'm always rooting for Mike. I think he's great for the game. And uh, I got to be honest with you, I'm rooting for Mike to one day buy a racetrack. Uh, I'm rooting for Mike to buy an ADW. Uh, if you have any ideas of, of, of any of those that he can do, let me know. And like he said, he said, oh, I can be his agent, so we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, I want to thank our friends at Guitar Racing uh, for making this possible. I want to thank Mike Rapoli for taking the time. Uh, gave us a good hour and a half um, of his time to, to chat a little bit. We'll be rooting for him, the Misfits, and Forte on, on, on Saturday. Um, and uh, I want to thank uh, PTF, Drew, and all the people uh, at the money behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, Acacia, Maggie, Maddie Ice. Um, I don't know why I always struggle with this because it's like I do it every week. Um, Michelle, Billy. I'm sure I'm, I'm forgetting someone. Oh, Nick Tamaro. He's on quite a bit now, isn't he? Um, thank you guys. And like I said, we're, we are, I'm recording 
video, Angel Cordero, uh, this week. It'll be out the week after the Florida Derby. So, so Tuesday or Wednesday, the, I don't have a calendar in front of me. You'll figure it out. See you next week. I need to know everything. Who in the what and the where I need everything. Trust me, I hear what you're saying, but I like it's new what you're telling me. I'm curious, George. I hop in the Porsche, five and a horse. I'm ready for war. I'm coming for throws to turn to a ghost. I need to know everything. Now you'd be surprised at the info you get is by letting them talk, so I'm letting them talk.